Good morning, church family. If you haven't had a chance to meet me yet, as they said, my name is Caleb Rhodes. I have the privilege of doing marriage and men's ministry here at PCBC. Uh, I'll be out front after the service. I'd love to shake your hand, meet you for the first time, or uh, meet you for the uh, second time. Let's dive in here. Uh, life is better when you know a guy. Would you agree? You know, like when it's the middle of Texas or the middle of summer in Texas and your AC goes out and your friend's like, oh yeah, I know a guy who can fix that today, like right now. Life's better when you know a guy. Well, my wife recently had a, I guess you could call it a know a guy experience. She got invited to go to a concert with some friends to see a band that she had been in love with since she was a teenager. Right? And so they bought the tickets and they'd had them reserved for weeks. And on the day that she was supposed to go to what she thought was going to be an ordinary experience in a concert, she put on her brand new band t-shirt that she bought from Amazon. She fixed her hair and she went and met up with her friends so that they could all ride together to the American Airlines Arena. Now she's telling me this after the fact, but she said as they were driving into the American Airlines Center, they didn't turn to go with the rest of the crowd to the general parking area. Instead, they took a turn and they went and they parked underneath the arena. They parked in the VIP parking. And then they got out and they got on a VIP elevator and they went up to a VIP section where they walked to a VIP box suite. And when my wife walked in, she turned and looked at her friend and she said, is, uh, is this all for us? You know, my wife had expected to walk through the metal detectors and sit beside some sweaty guy in a plastic fold-out chair in the arena with the rest of the people, right? And her friend said, oh yeah, my husband works for the guy who owns the box. And so all of this comes with your ticket. It all came with their tickets. The VIP box, the box seats, the food, the drinks, the service, the staff, the incredible view, everything came with her ticket. You may see where this is going and some of the theological implications of it, but much like my wife in the story, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you too know a guy. In fact, you know the guy. But unfortunately, too many Christians are uninformed about what it really means to be saved. To live under the new covenant in Christ's blood and the new kingdom that was established by his death and resurrection. So that's exactly what we're going to talk about from the text this morning. We're going to talk about a new and better life in the kingdom of God. We're going to be in Hebrews chapters 12 and 13. And we're going to see three things specifically about this better life in the kingdom. We're going to see the benefits the behaviors and the blessings, the benefits and the blessings, and what we do with that new knowledge affects our behaviors as well. So throughout this sermon series, we've been walking through the book of Hebrews, and as you may have heard, one of the major hurdles of reading this book or of preaching through this book is that there's a contextual gap between where we are as modern readers and where a first century perhaps Jewish or Greco-Roman reader would have been when they were reading the text. Because the author makes copious references back to the Old Testament, back to the law, back to the sacrificial system. And if you don't take into account the gap between when they were writing and now, it doesn't make as much sense. It doesn't impact us in the same way. And so hopefully one of my goals today is to help explain some of these references in a way that the text would impact us with the same significance as it did to the first and original audience that received the letter. So in many ways, the author of this book, who's otherwise unknown, some think it's Paul, others Luke perhaps, but the author here has been leading us on a journey. Much like the Israelites who, was, who were wandering through the wilderness, who he references numerous times throughout the book, this author has been leading us, the readers, on somewhat of an apologetic spiritual journey where he is arguing that Jesus Christ is better. Jesus is the better guide, the better high priest, the better leader. And today we're going to see that Jesus also offers us a better life. So today, like the Israelites, when they arrived at Mount Sinai for the giving of the law, the author finishes our journey. He finishes the book by leading us to the foot of a different mountain, to Mount Zion. And he's going to offer us a new and better life in a new covenant and a new kingdom with God. So first, let's look at the benefits of the new kingdom. 
We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 and following. God's word says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you, readers, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better, speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Man, right out the gate, there is a lot going on in those verses. So let's unpack it just a bit. This section here pretty much serves as a climax for the entire letter. The author is drawing together all of his theological threads and he's going to make this final argument as he closes out the book. And the argument is that the new covenant, the new kingdom established by Jesus for everyone is in fact better than the old covenant that was established for Israel. And one of the ways the author does this is by comparing and contrasting the giving of the law to Israel through Moses at Sinai to the reception of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is imaged here as Mount Zion. Let's take a look here at the comparison from the text. In those first few verses, look at how the author describes the scene at Sinai when God gave the law, gave the law to Israel. He says it was a stormy scene that included images of burning and fire and darkness and gloom. The people that were present were so terrified that they actually begged for it to stop. They begged God to stop speaking because they couldn't handle it anymore. And what happened if anyone or anything touched the mountain where God's holiness was present? The text said they must be killed. This is imagery straight from a nightmare. And the author is describing Sinai as a mountain of fear. But this was justifiable fear, however, because God was demonstrating in this instance a key characteristic of his nature. And that was his holiness. And we know that his holiness is not something to be taken lightly because of our sin. Because sin stands as the antithesis to holiness. We are as sinful people are all deserving ultimately of facing the holy wrath of a just God. And so the giving of the law at Mount Sinai was intended to provide the guidelines for how the sinful people in the kingdom of Israel were to interact and live in relationship to a holy and righteous God. And this scene here is characterized by a sobering and powerful demonstration of what it means to be in the presence of God and his holiness. They stood in fear at Mount Sinai. Now let's look at how the author describes the other mountain, Mount Zion. He says in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. He's talking to us. He's talking to believers in Jesus. And notice here, the city of the living God, this is the same God that was at Sinai. He calls it the heavenly Jerusalem because this is a new and a better life than the earthly Jerusalem. It's a new and better life in the presence of God. It says you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. The author is painting a picture that this new kingdom of God under the new covenant is to be characterized by joy, not of fear. And in verse 23, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. This new kingdom that Zion represents here in this text is characterized by the promise of Christ's righteousness to all who believe in him, not by the requirements of the law. It's characterized by the promise of Christ's righteousness, not by the requirements of the law. Whereas Sinai here is pictured as a mountain of fear, Zion is a mountain of joy. Friends, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of joy, not of fear. And this is only possible because someone 
Jesus has satisfied the wrath of the holy God. And that leads us into the next comparison that the author makes as he continues through the text here. He says, as awesome as the circumstances were for this divine disbursement of the law at Mount Sinai, the reception of the gospel of grace through Jesus Christ is far more awesome. He compares and contrasts here Moses and Jesus. In verse 21, the author describes the scene of Sinai as so terrifying that even Moses, even Moses, who was chosen by God to be the human mediator, to receive the law and to give it to the people of Israel and oversee their obedience to it, even he is said to be trembling in fear in the presence of a holy God. We know that Moses was a temporary human mediator that ultimately he fell short of the righteous requirements of a holy God and he experienced death. But the author says, no, 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 not so with Jesus. Take a look in verse 24. Verse 24 says, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant whose blood speaks better than the blood of Abel. Think, what in the world is he talking about? Put your Bible hats on and go back to Genesis. Abel was the first shedding of human blood in scripture, in recorded history that we know of. The first homicide. And after he dies, scripture says that his blood cried out to God. And what did his blood cry out for? Abel's blood cried out for justice and judgment. But look at the comparison. The author is saying that Jesus' blood does not cry out. Rather, where Abel's blood cried out for justice and judgment, Jesus' blood declares redemption and forgiveness. To all who experience it and to all who are sprinkled by it by placing their faith in his life, death, and resurrection. See the picture here. Whereas Moses was trembling, Jesus was triumphing over sin and over death. And through his blood, we now have full access to the Father. No longer are we standing at the foot of Sinai, trembling in fear of facing the wrath of a righteous God. But because of the intercession of Jesus, his death, his life, his resurrection on our behalf, we now have full access to the presence of the Father. Friends, that is the benefit of living in the new kingdom and the new covenant. Unlike Moses, Jesus is the better mediator of the better covenant who has ushered in a better kingdom. And verse 28 tells us about that kingdom. It says, we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The kingdom of God is an eternal, unshakable kingdom for which the kingdom of Israel and the law was only meant to be a foreshadowing of. It was only meant to serve a purpose until the ultimate fulfillment comes in the person of Jesus Christ. And the new covenant is ratified by the blood of Jesus And his new kingdom provides a better life that is characterized by joy and not a fear. As we rest in the finished work of Jesus on our behalf. And through faith in him, we have access to the fullness of those benefits and to those blessings. That's good news. Unfortunately, though, I fear that there's still some Christians that are trying to live out their salvation in such a way that they're standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, hoping that in some way they can curry God's favor and avoid his wrath by living a righteous life. But friends, this is not the message of the gospel of Mount Zion that's imaged here. The message of the gospel is grace. You can't earn it and you can't lose it. The gospel is free and it is forever. It is for everyone. So stop living in the light and the shadow of Sinai and grab a hold of the joy that we have in Jesus. Our joy in Jesus is not one of fear, but it is a joy, a freedom that he has granted to us. One commentator expresses this sentiment well. He writes this. It would be a shame if people never hear the music of the heavenly Jerusalem because the thunder of our Sinai drowns it out. If they never move past trembling Moses to meet Jesus who stands with outstretched hands. What a beautiful picture the author of the text is painting for us this morning of these two mountains and how the grace, the gospel of Jesus is truly the better covenant, the better kingdom and the better life for all those who believe. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you have access to those full benefits now 
Eternal life is not just something we look forward to, but eternal life begins now with the relationship of Jesus. And we have the joy of those benefits here and now, of grace and of freedom and of joy. And we should live like it. We should live like Catherine did when she found out she had access to all of those privileges that night at the concert. And when it comes to our tickets and the encouraging news that Jesus, that Jesus has paid it for us. Jesus has paid our price of admission into the presence of a holy and righteous God. Let's live like it. So we looked at the benefits of the new kingdom. Now, let's take a look at this next very practical section beginning in chapter 13 here. We're going to look at the behaviors of the new kingdom. Now, one thing that Catherine mentioned to me about that night Uh, her night as queen of the concert, if you will, is that initially she didn't know how to behave. All right, let me explain. So neither Catherine nor I grew up in what you would consider to be VIP homes. Now don't get me wrong, our homes were loving, they were full of joy, and they provided everything that we needed. But when we went to special events or when we went on vacation, we parked with the commoners, we ate with the commoners, we sat with the commoners, right? We were not the VIP type of family. And especially when we stayed at hotels, we didn't stay at hotels that had drinks and snacks in the room. They didn't have many bars, right? And if they did, we knew better than to touch them because why? Because they're not included with the price of the stay, right? And so when Catherine walked into this room and she saw a refrigerator full of drinks and she saw snacks everywhere, she wasn't entirely sure what to do with all of it. But after she asked her friend and she was told, yes, All of this comes with your ticket. It's all included in the price of admission. You know what she did? She partook in every single one of them, just like she should have, and didn't bring me a single thing home, except the sermon illustration. So maybe we're we're even. But like this story, in the next set of verses, the author explains that life in the new kingdom, it's already begun. And this knowledge... Our understanding of what it means to be under the new covenant, in the new kingdom, it should impact how we live our lives, how we behave. I want to be very clear here, as I hope that we always are from the pulpit. Our behavior does not gain us anything, right? We do not live for grace. We live out of the grace that we have already received. You see, salvation comes first. We are first justified. And then through the knowledge and through the experience of our new relationship with Jesus Christ, our actions and our attitudes are sanctified and changed. Don't get that twisted. As we look through these next verses, we're not going to linger very long on any of these individual points. But they're supposed to serve here as practical examples of the character of believers who are living in the new kingdom. These are practical examples of things that should characterize the life of believers living in the new kingdom. Let's take a look at each of these briefly. Chapter 13, verse 1. He says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. It's interesting that he puts this one first because love ultimately is the key characteristic that the rest of these will flow out of. As a believer, our life should be categorized by radical love. People in the world should look at us and go, wow, there's something radical about the way that the Christians are interacting with one another and with others. And we know through the words of Jesus that the key distinguisher of people that are living in the kingdom is what? How they love one another. goes on in verse 2 to say... Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. So here is an opportunity to to close that contextual gap just a little bit. For when we think of hospitality, it's very similar, but perhaps just enough different that some background helps. See, during the first century, they didn't have hotels and motels in the same way that we do now. And when they did, there really weren't the kind of places that you would want to stay, especially if you had a family, right? And so the key here for hospitality is that when they were traveling from city to city, they were relying upon the people within that city, especially other believers and followers of Jesus, to open up their homes to them and provide them with something to eat during their travels. So what does that say to us? Well, first of all, it doesn't say that you have to take all the strangers that walk through your neighborhood into your house. 
But what it does say is that we should have homes that are characterized by an atmosphere of hospitality. Our homes should be places that are open to people who we know, who we love, and who are in need. And we should be ministering to those people in our homes. Our homes should be a place of a non-anxious presence. We should have homes that people enjoy being in, including the people that live there. Our homes should be used as a means of ministering to others. He continues on in verse 3 and says, Continue to remember those in prison as if, don't miss that, as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves are suffering. The author's calling us to empathetic living here. He's saying caring for and serving the disenfranchised just as if you were suffering as they were suffering. That characterizes the life of believer. And you know, friends, there's many ways that you can serve in those capacities in our church. And from what I've seen the last few years of being here, our church gets really high marks in this area. We have so many ways that you can get involved and that you can serve uh, on a, a ministry of empathy. I think about our connect groups. In that within our connect groups, we have care groups. And those care groups are so essential to visiting hospitals, to going and seeing people when they're sick and when they're out and when they have needs and loving their community as well. You see these beautiful flowers that we have in the sanctuary almost every Sunday. Uh, we have a flower ministry that's led up by Deborah Roundtree. And these flowers are taken out every Monday morning and they're distributed to our in-home members. They're a source of ministry to our church. We've got other ministries such as Serving Hands that's led up by Dan Young. where retired age men in our church are serving the widows within our church and community that have needs. We've got men of Nehemiah that several men, including Larry Richardson in our church, play a big role in. If you didn't know, uh, men of Nehemiah, they're going to be with us on, I think it's October 22nd. Uh, they're going to be with us as we celebrate. That's exciting. But we've also got other opportunities that pop up from here, uh, here and there. And we've got one very special opportunity right now in our church. Many of you may know, some of you may not. A couple weeks ago... 13-year-old boy by the name of Pike Peterson. He's in our student ministry here. The Petersons are a beloved family of our church, faithful members and leaders. Uh, he was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. So much so that within 24 hours of receiving the diagnosis, he was already starting chemotherapy. And he's going to have to have pretty much an immediate life-saving bone marrow transplant. None of his family are able to, to, to give. They would if they could. They're not matches. And we're going to have a match event here on our campus on August the 27th where anybody in the community and in our church can come in. It's going to run from 930 to 3 and you'll be able to be swapped and tested to see if you are a donor match for him to save this young man's life on August the 27th. This is just one example of many opportunities that this church has to serve those who are disenfranchised, to suffer as if they were suffering. And I got to say, guys, from what I have seen, I got to give you guys a pat on the back, the way you come around each other in community and love well. And it's so encouraging for the ministerial staff here when we know that the people that we are trying to serve and love well also serve and love well. It truly is a blessing. Christian lives, the author says here, should be characterized by a life of empathy. Continues on in verse 4. He says, marriage should be honored by all. <clears throat> and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Now, typically when we hear this type of language in scripture, especially in our current culture, we hear about sexual immorality. Where do our minds run? A lot of our minds probably run to the LGBTQ debates and communities and, and rhetoric there. But I want to be careful here not to present this as if it's us in here versus them out there. Because remember, the Bible is an in-house document. It was written for believers. So we're often quick to condemn those other people. But statistically, those within the Christian community are not living by a much better sexual ethic than those outside of the Christian community. For example, and hopefully these don't apply here at PCBC, but in the, the larger Christian community, we've almost come to expect that sex before marriage is a norm. That's just what you do, right? The Christian community is also suffering from rampant domestic violence rates and divorce rates almost at the same level as our non-Christian community.
communities. Why? Why is that? And I think it's because we have not done a good job both teaching and understanding the sacredness of human sexuality and marriage from the Bible. Sex and marriage is sacred and it is valuable. So the author talks about keeping the marriage bed pure. And what he means by that is that there is no sex outside of marriage. That means no third parties in the bedroom. That includes pornography, right? Pornography defiles the purity of marriage and it will ruin your current marriage. And friends, if you're single, it will ruin your future marriage. Pornography is an evil that perpetrates ruin on marriages. The author is saying here that living out a biblical sexual ethic is a huge witness, especially in our current culture. Living out a biblical sexual ethic is a huge witness to Christian character in the culture. But I want to make sure that I address this as well today. There's some of you here who have suffered in the past from sexual trauma and sexual abuse. Please hear me when I say this, friends. That sin is not yours. You are not responsible for the evil that has been perpetrated on you in those situations. And if you have never had an opportunity to process that in a healthy way, please come talk to me or one of our other ministers. And we'll make sure that you have an opportunity to do that in a confidential way. Right? God grieves alongside of those who have suffered evil at the hands of those who would seek to corrupt the sexuality that God has so beautifully given us. Nothing is too much for God's grace to restore and to heal. He continues on here in verse 5, and he says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. How are we doing in that area? Are we placing our trust in material resources or in God? Right? Because ultimately, materialism is saying God is not enough. It's saying, God, you're, you're enough up until I need this. God, you're enough as long as I have over this in my X, Y, Z. And as I was thinking this week and studying, I began to ask myself, well, how do I know if I'm materialistic? How do you you self-diagnose that problem? And I think I've got a couple of of very pragmatic ways to do that. Ask yourself the question, are you someone who's content? Are you content with what you have or are you constantly pursuing the next thing, the next gadget, the next car, the next phone? Are you someone who's always wanting more? Or are you you buying things just because you can afford it? Or just because you need it? Ask yourself, are you a giver? Are you living a life that's being characterized by generosity? You know, John Wesley, in one of his famous sermons on Christian stewardship of money, he says this regarding believers and how they handle their finances. He says, earn all you can. That sounds pretty good. It's kind of weird for a pastor to say. Earn all you can. Save all you can. And then give all you can. That balances it out. Are you living a life that's characterized by generosity? He says, be content. And he reminds us in verse 6 there that God is our ultimate source of comfort and of help. We don't rely on our own will to be able to be content in this life, but we learn to lean on God as our ultimate source of comfort and help. Now, guys, as I'm walking through this, this is not some advanced course on Christianity, right? These are basic characteristics that should characterize the life of a believer who is living in the new kingdom. Love, hospitality, empathy, sexual accountability, and contentment. These are the basics. This is how our lives should look on a regular basis. The author continues on in verses 7 through 9, and he calls us to honor and imitate our leaders as they imitate Christ. And I can say, honestly, we have some incredible staff here. As someone who works behind the curtain, I can say that we truly have a staff that is seeking to imitate Christ and is worthy of honor. And speaking of incredible leadership that's characterized by humility and grace and wisdom and Christ-likeness, on Monday, during our uh, normal staff prayer time, Our pastor had us pause for a moment and celebrate one individual within our church staff that has been here for 28 years. He's sitting right here on the front row, Rodney Shell. If you know Rodney, you know Rodney keeps the wheels on this place, right? But he does so much more than that. He leads out of love, out of wisdom, and out of Christ-likeness. You know, I had a friend who interviewed for a job here, and he asked me, he said, he, he got the job. 
Uh, he said, uh, I'm interviewing with this guy named Rodney. What do I need to know about him? And I said, here's what you need to know about Rodney. Two things, honestly. This is what I told him. I said, Rodney loves the Lord. And Rodney loves Park City's Baptist Church. And he's going to do what he feels like is best for both of those. So we want to apply the text right now to you and say, Rodney, we want to honor you and say thank you so much for your service to us. The author here picks up in verse 8 and tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he's saying is that the standard of character for Christ, for a Christ follower, never changes because Jesus' character never changes. Friends, let us never disparage the gospel of grace that we've received with behaviors that stand in direct opposition to it. Do not be known as the Christians that go to the restaurant after church and don't tip. Be generous people. Live lives that are characterized by biblical Christian ethics. Now, finally, we've looked at the benefits and behaviors. We'll close here briefly with the blessings of the new kingdom. The final section here, it highlights the blessings of the new covenant and the new kingdom. And the blessing is this, that we no longer, as the priests of the Old Testament did, have to offer the blood sacrifice because Jesus has offered his in our place. In verse 10, he says, we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. So some people in the audience here were likely struggling with returning to the rituals of Judaism, which they were only meant to be a foreshadowing of the future fulfillment to come in Christ anyways. And the author says they have no right to eat at the table because Jesus was functioning as both the priest and the sacrifice. This was unprecedented thinking in Judaism. And not only was he functioning as both priest and sacrifice, Jesus, his body did not remain dead, but his body was resurrected and restored. His blood sacrifice for our sins was permanent, and his resurrection from the dead demonstrates God's acceptance of it. So therefore, now we are being called to sacrifice on behalf of Jesus, as verse 13 tells us, not by shedding of blood, because he's done that on our behalf, but by bearing the disgrace that he bore. Friends, following Jesus should cost you something. Don't mishear me. Salvation is free, but living a life that is faithful and Christ-like and obedient to God, it may just be the costliest thing that you ever do, but it's worth it. But it's worth it. And that's exactly what he calls us to and The final verses here, 15 through 19. Christians are called to sacrifice, to identify with Christ. And when the time comes that standing with Christ is viewed as something shameful or as countercultural, then we ought to be willing to do it. Then the author calls the believers there in 17 through 19 to submit to their leaders and to pray for them. He calls us to unity among the body, a Christian submission is always mutual submission. We submit to one another in love and we never lord over others because of our position. And we pray for one another. I love serving you. I love serving our church. And I can promise you that we are praying for you as a staff on a daily and a weekly basis. And this is a good reminder. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastoral staff. Because we are praying for you. Let's be a church that is known both for unity among our body and for prayer. So as we close here, we looked at the benefits, the behaviors, and the blessings of living in the new kingdom. And I think back to Catherine's trip to the concert. She had no idea for those weeks that she had that ticket. She had no idea of the benefits and the blessings that she was in possession of. Until she experienced it herself and had someone explain it to her. Then and only then did it radically alter her behavior and how she was living out her life at that concert. And friends, that was just a few hours. That was just a few hours. How much better do we now, knowing that we no longer stand at the foot of Mount Sinai, trembling before a holy and righteous God, fearing his judgments, because we have received the grace of Jesus Christ through his blood as our propitiation, how much more should this knowledge not affect the rest of our life here? Friends, that's good news. That is good news. Let that knowledge, the benefits and the blessings of living in the new kingdom, 
under the new covenant, let that guide your behavior into Christ's likeness. As we close out here, I was thinking this week, how do I apply this text? What is, how does this text apply to us today, right? There's shedding of blood, there's sacrifices. You know, what do we do with this? And I remembered today we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we've talked at great length about the shedding of blood and the new covenant and what Christ's sacrifice means for us. And this is exactly what this represents. In scripture, Christ said that the blood represents his new covenant and the bread uh, is his body broken for you. So as we go into this, how we're gonna apply this text today is that we take a few moments to prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the elements. I wanna invite you to do that, maybe in a renewed way today, recognizing the significance that it is that we no longer have to stand in judgment and face the wrath of a holy, righteous God for our sin. But as this represents, Jesus has done that on our behalf. Take this with a grateful heart today. Ask God to search you, to know your heart, and take it maybe with a new sense of reverence for the first time. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to lead into a time with the elements. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity today uh, to open your word, to have the privilege and the freedom to uh, listen uh, and to respond to the word that you've given us. May we never take that for granted. Thank you first and foremost, God, for your son Jesus who has died as the propitiation, the satisfaction of your wrath for our sins. As we partake of these elements, may we not do so in a lighthearted way, but recognizing the significance as best as we can of what your sacrifice means for us. We're eternally grateful for that. We ask God that you would bless our time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.